been raised by the grace of God, amen, I have been raised to a future with that end, I set my eyes on a true and loyal friend, the one whose life I'm hidden in. Oh, Jesus.
is yours.
Good morning, Riverview Church. Good to have you here this morning. Thank you for singing from your heart. We're going to dismiss our kids and our junior high and senior high. Before you see it, turn around, and greet somebody, welcome them to Riverview Church. All right, good morning, Riverview. Wednesday, I didn't have any voice at all. I'm struggling to get my voice back. So uh, I'll probably not be standing out the patio. I don't want to give it to anybody, but uh, getting back, slowly getting my voice back. Well, welcome. Come on in, come on in, lady. All right. <laughs> By the way, in your bulletins, next, uh, abide, uh, or I'm sorry, live inside. That's our verse memorization um, program that we're doing this year every Week, a different verse. If you pull it out, Romans 10, 9, let's read it together. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Great verse, by the way. Again, another great verse. So put this with your all the others. By the end of the year, you should have 52 verses and uh, you'll love it. You'll love being able to quote God's word when you're sharing your faith. Well, take them to your dinner table, review them with your kids, or maybe at night before they go to bed, and help them to learn God's word. That's, by the way, what Awana will do for your kids if you plug them into Awana, this new ministry that we're starting here at the church. So good to have you. Um, we have so much going on. Don't forget that we have our women's Bible studies, Wednesday morning at 930, coffee break and tasting room. That same study for tasting room is done Thursday night at 6.30. Men, we meet at 6.30. Uh, so please join us for that. Uh, never, you don't worry about coming in the middle of a study. Just come, be a part of it. We have a great group of men that meet right here in this room. Uh, we put tables up and just coffee and snacks, that sort of thing. Also, a week from tomorrow, we are having our Biblical Action Ministry Night. We're going to have a movie night. We're going to show a letter to the American church by Eric Metaxas, a documentary. And we have a couple of guest uh, special speakers that are going to share what they are doing here in California to try to uh, rein in the school system a bit and to have a little more accountability as to what goes on in the schools. You'd love to hear about that. But we're going to have a movie night a week from tomorrow. So put that on your calendar. We'll tell you more about it next week. And uh, we're going to watch... This video now by Pastor Jeremiah for the rest of our announcements. I'll say a few words, then Bill, one of our elders, who just retired, by the way. Congratulations. Congratulations, Bill. Uh, he's going to come and pray. So let's watch this video. Good morning, church. Pastor Jeremiah here, and here are your morning announcements. If you're looking for a place to serve here at Riverview, we have the Connections booth. It's an awesome opportunity to find out what volunteer opportunities that we have on the patio on Sundays and during the week. Go stop by and check it out for more info. Riverview, Night for All is here. Every Tuesday, we have child care, junior high program, high school program, and adult Bible study every Tuesday here. It's something for everyone. So come out to the patio, seek Pastor Ben, myself, or Hopena for any questions, and you need to sign up uh, for child care if you have kids that want to come as well. Awana is coming to you this fall, church. We need volunteers to step up and serve alongside of us to get this program off and running. So if you're interested in serving this fall, please put Awana in the connection card and we'll, Miss Janae will reach out to you. Desert Trip is this Saturday. Today is the last day to sign up family. So if you're interested in going or want more info, go see the motorcycle out on the patio. Families, I'm so excited to share on April 12th through the 14th, we're gonna be having family camp up in Julian. It's gonna be intense and it's gonna be intense. There's limited spots, about 50 people can sign up total. Come out to the patio and I'll answer any questions that you might have. Holy Week is coming up, so save the dates for our Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and our Easter service. After that, we have our International Day of Prayer. We'll give you more info as it comes up. Church, it's been so great to be able to give you the announcements. Come say hi on the patio. We'll love to get to know you and pray for you and hang out with you. See you later. 
Speaking of the patio, did you notice anything different out on the patio? Do you love our new gazebos or what? We are going to outlaw the word canopies at Riverview Church because we love our gazebos so much. But uh, thank you, men, those that were here yesterday to help put those up. Uh, these guys worked really hard, and thank you. we got a couple more we're going to be putting up uh, in time, but we're, I'm so excited about the look of the patios, and it minimizes the setup and tear down for our volunteers as well, so that is phenomenal. By the way, I forgot to mention, if you're a visitor here, welcome. So glad you're here. Love for you to fill out the uh, connection card that's in your bulletin. Drop it in one of our offering boxes. Let us know you're here. There's an, a blue offering box in the back, and there's a couple of them on the patio as well, and pick up our coffee mug that we have for you. And by the way, do we have our QR code? If you zoom in on our QR code, download the app. Great way to uh, get announcements about the church. Thank you for giving. You can do that easily on the app to the work of the Lord here, getting behind what we're doing. Uh, our desire is to lift up the name of Jesus Christ and see lives changed as a result. Bill, would you come and lead us in a word of prayer, brother? Thank you. We're praying for Bruce Camp today. He's leading ministries in uh, uh, Cuba, and it's an area, of course, that's a aggressive against the gospel. Let's pray for that group. Father, we pray, thank you for Bruce and his ministry to the men and women who are serving Christ in Cuba. And we just ask that you would protect them as they are bold with your gospel and spread the faith of Christ. Lord, continue to bless him and give him great wisdom in this region. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
takes no one beside you forever the hope in my heart amen please be seated lord thank you that you are forever the hope in our heart as we open up your word today we pray that our hearts will be ready to receive it, and we thank you that you're here with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good to have you here. We're going to continue our study in James, and I hope my pray my, my voice makes it through. You know, having this voice issue this week reminded me of something that happened to me when I was about 11 years old. I was involved in a church in New Jersey with my family, obviously, my mom and my dad and my brothers, and uh, when we were there, we were going to have a special speaker come to our church on a Sunday night. And the church was going to be packed. And the minister of music went to my mom and said, hey, I heard your son, who's 11 years old, that was me, uh, plays the violin. I picked it up because my dad played it, and I, I kind of wanted to be my, like my dad. So I started playing the violin. But then I realized that in my school, I was the only boy violinist. Everybody else was girls. So having the name Melvin and being a violin player really didn't help me much. Um, <laughs> And I didn't really want to play. I told my mom, I don't want to play. And she said, well, I've already talked to the minister of music, and it's a, it's a done deal. You and your brother are going to play a duet. So I thought, okay, if I practice hard enough, I, I, I at least won't embarrass myself. Um, so my brother and I practiced this hymn called Come Thou Fount. And he played the clarinet. I the violin. We were a duet. Got up on the, on the platform. The church was packed. And we started to play. And everything started to go pretty well initially. And I was doing fine. Then all of a sudden... I heard this cracking from my violin, and the main cable on my violin that held all four strings of the violin snapped all four strings in front of all the, the, the whole audience that was there. All my strings flew off. My bridge, which is holding the strings, fell to the ground, and my violin pretty much self-destructed in front of everybody's eye. And I'm standing there, my brother, I'm holding my violin, the pieces are hanging down, my brother's playing his clarinet, he's kind of glancing over, he slowly comes to a stop, we both look at each other and just go down and sit down. <laughs> and uh, so the special speaker comes up, and of course, I, and what happened was, everybody laughed, right, just like you just did. They actually laughed uh, as my violin dismantled, which I would have too, I guess, but um, I sat down, and the speaker comes up, and he says, young man, I know exactly what you're feeling like. You know, as, as a speaker, I, I've at times lost my voice, and it can be so embarrassing, so I know exactly what you're going through. And I'm thinking the whole time, no, you don't. No. That's, it, mine's much worse than that. But uh, it was funny, the very next day, this is true, the very next day, I was near my house, uh, near the church, actually, because our house was close to the church, and there was a playground there basketball court, and I went to sit on a swing, and this mom came up with her kid on the playground, and I noticed she kept looking over at me, and I thought, why is this woman looking over at me? So finally, she comes over to me, and she says, are, are you Mel Svensson? I said, yes, yes, I am, and I thought, oh, the Lord has sent me someone to encourage me in my moment of defeat. She said, oh, I wasn't there last night at church, but my husband was, he told me that was the funniest thing he'd ever seen in church. Well, I thank you very, very much for sharing that with me. Thank you. <laughs> I hope this lady took some grief counseling courses later because she was terrible at it. So after years of counseling, I finally got over it. I have a little twitch in my neck, though, from it. But after, other than that, I'm fine. So to say that, I went through a trial as an 11-year-old kid. Still, after that, kids would just look at me and laugh at my violin self-destructing. I mean, that went on for years. I had ladies years later say, I still remember when your violin broke in church. So trials, right? We go through these moments that are so embarrassing or difficult, many worse than that. And that's what we're talking about today. It's this understanding trials. Please turn your Bibles to James chapter 1. We're opening the Word of God, and we're going to look at what the Word of God says about trials, because so often we get trials wrong. We don't think about trials the right way like God tells us to. The bottom line is page 1011, by the way, in your chair Bibles. Pr please bring your Bibles. We love having open Bibles here at Riverview Church. Bottom line is this. God's works, work, God works in our lives through difficult trials to accomplish His purposes and bring us 
to a mature faith. That's what he desires to do. God works in our lives every single day. You might think, well, Mel, how does he do that? I mean, there's so many people in the world. Because he's infinite, you're finite. It would be difficult for any person to possibly even attempt to do that. But for the God of this universe that can create 400 billion galaxies out of nothing, ex nihilo, it's not too hard, right? That's why in your prayers, you can bring your smallest needs to him. He's not overloaded. I have had people tell me that over the years. Oh, Mel, I don't want to pray to God about my, like, illness. I mean, he's got wars around the world he's dealing with. Well, that would be a problem for God if he was finite. But he's infinite. We serve an awesome, big God. Let me remind you about the book of James, written by the half-brother of Jesus, grew up in the household with Jesus. We talked about that pressure, right, last week. Imagine growing up with Jesus, the perfect older brother. It was written about 46 to 50 AD, probably the first letter written in the New Testament. The theme of the book is what does faith look like, right? It's actualizing your Christianity, putting it into action, that's what James is all about. It's not just saying, I have faith, but it's putting it into action. A lot of people are big on theory, low on practice. We don't want to be like that. We want to take our faith and what the Word of God teaches and put it into action. Put it into action. A faith that saves you is a faith that changes you. What's the goal? Always to be like Jesus. So clear from God's Word. Couldn't be any clear. The key verse, I think, in the book is this. Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It's dead. You say you have faith, but it doesn't change you at all? Then it's a dead faith. If the Holy Spirit is living inside of you, he will change you. Let's read James chapter 1. We talked about uh, James being a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? That's how he de defined himself. That was his identity. And the challenge for all of us to see ourselves in the same way, that doulos, bond slave, bond servant of God. God, I'm your property. I willingly become your slave. My life is yours, right? That's how James was. I love that about James. He says this in verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have, here it is, its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. See, as you read that verse, there's a couple oxymorons, right? Count it all joy when you experience various trials. In the King James Version, if you have that, it says diverse temptations. That's really not a good translation of that word in the context of James chapter 1, verse 2. It's really trials. It's, it's not just the things that have evil motives against you. It's anything difficult in your life. And we're going to talk about those categories in just a minute. But count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. Here's the first point I want to make. Trials are part of life, but remind us that God is at work. See, every trial you have, uh, there's different ways you can respond. An elementary level Christianity would say this, God, why are you letting this happen to me? Why is this happening? I'm one of your children, God. I just came to faith in Christ a few months ago. Why are you letting this happen? Elementary school Christianity, right? But as you grow in your faith, this, this graduate level response, instead of saying, why, God, are you letting this happen to me, implying, God, you're not doing a good job in the God department. You can do better. Instead of responding like that, you respond by saying, God, what are you trying to teach me through this? How are you trying to strengthen me through this trial. We've talked about this before, how every coach, every parent knows the benefit of strengthening, for example, as a coach, your athletes. That's why a coach runs his or her athletes in practice. They're strengthening the team for the contest that lies ahead. By the way, I don't know if you heard, but my son's team, Carlsbad High School, that he plays for, last night they won the county championship. 
Yeah, ranked, ranked number one in San Diego County. They're ranked fifth in the entire state of California. So now they enter the California State Playoffs, and we will see how they do. But I know a lot of you have been asking about it. So, yes, they won the county championship last night. Close game, but they pulled it out. Why does the coach want those guys? To get them ready for the county championship, right? That's why they work hard and practice. And God uses the trials in our life to strengthen us. We don't like that. We'd rather God would do it a different way. God, can't I eat um, ice cream and cheesecake and get stronger instead of having trials? No, this is the plan of God, that he can take the negative circumstances of our lives and grow us up, strengthen us. Here it is. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Now, I define trials as this, hardships which God either permits or causes. Some people struggle with that word causes. I've had people say to me, God would never do anything to hurt me. He would never do that. I, yes, he would, as a matter of fact. It, it happened. You can see it all through the Bible, right? Where God, a, a believer, is walking away from God, walking away from God's plan. And as a loving father, right, every parent knows this. When you have your own children, you will discipline your kids to help them grow up. You're, no, I'm going to discipline you not to do that thing because that thing could, could kill you. I'm going to discipline you to do something really good because I love you that much. That's exactly what our perfect Heavenly Father does in our lives. He takes negative circumstances. And by the way, they can be evil circumstances. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. But give me one Great example from the Bible where God takes the evil actions of people and turns it into something awesome. What is the example of that? The cross, exactly, where Jesus crucified on the cross by the evil actions of others. I think some people said Joseph. That's Joseph's another great example. The evil actions of others led Jesus to be crucified, but it was all part of God's bigger plan. Did the disciples understand it at the time? No. no. They were running scared, hiding in upper rooms. They didn't realize that what just happened was the salvation of the entire world. If people would just receive it, it was awesome. That's how God works. See, my friends, God is not a little God. God is not a little God. He's an awesome God. He can take the evil actions of others, even when meant to shut down faith and, and people who believe in Jesus. He can turn that into something truly awesome. So God either permits it or causes it in our lives to accomplish his purpose, even I mean, if we respond in godly obedience. That's the key. See, it'll turn out good if we respond in godly obedience. If we recognize, instead of having that elementary level Christianity that says, God, why me? I thought I was special. Instead of saying, God, what are you trying to teach me? And I will walk through this storm in my life that I'm experiencing because we live in a fallen world. I'm going to walk through this step by step, one decision at a time. I gave a ride to somebody yesterday that needed to get somewhere, and he was in my car, and he, we were talking about faith, and he's a relatively new follower of Christ, and he's saying, yeah, I'm just trying to understand all this theology, and I need to learn that more. And I said, you know what, that's great, and you do, but let me give you this word of advice right now. Walk the Christian life one decision at a time. It's only one day at a time. Tomorrow has enough worries of its own. Today, one step at a time, you're going to face a temptation, a trial. Make the right decision. One decision at a time. Then it's manageable. Then with the strength of Christ in your life, you can do it. You can do it one trial at a time. You're walking through it and responding in godly obedience. I'm not going to get bitter. By the way, that's the option as opposed to counting it all joy. What's the other side of that? If you don't count it joy when God's at work in your life, you're going to become bitter. You're going to become angry with God. You're going to pull away from God. You're going to go further down a path of destruction. That is not a good choice. That's a terrible choice. What James is asking, even though you might say, wow, that's hard. Counting it all joy when I experience 
various trials. That's not easy. But it's by far the better option to understand and know that God is walking with you, that he never leaves you. He never forsakes you. And that out of this trial, he's producing something awesome. What is that? To make you more like the awesome Savior we serve, and that's Jesus Christ. Now, will we ever get there in this life? No, but the goal is all the same. It's like the illustration I've used in the past of the, of the soccer ball in the locker room was complaining about all the shoes kicking the soccer ball. Oh, you guys are always kicking me and kicking me and kicking me until the shoes couldn't take it anymore. And finally, one of the smarter shoes spoke up and said, yes, soccer ball, but it's always toward the what? The goal. It's always toward the goal. And God can take the negative experiences of our lives and move us toward the goal of being more mature, stronger in our faith, more dependent on Jesus Christ. That's what Paul experienced. You probably know of Paul's thorn in the flesh that he complained about in 2 Corinthians, right? And he prayed that God would remove it, but God said no. And Paul finally realized that it was this thorn in the flesh that caused him to rely on God. In fact, God told him that. That this thorn in the flesh will cause you, Paul, to rely on me more. And then Paul finally concluded in the wisdom God gave him, when I am weak, then I am strong. Exactly. See, it's in the hardships of life that we become more dependent on God. So often, if things are going my way, and oh man, if things are just great, man, I can do this without God. I don't need God. I'm doing fine without Him. And pride sets in. And we start to think more of ourselves than we should. There's some real important textual points here that I want to bring out. One is this. He says, count it all joy. It's interesting that he didn't say, be joyful when you experience trials of various kinds. He didn't say that. He said, count it all joy. If you keep your finger in James chapter 1, turn to the left to the book of Philippians. Galatians, Ephesians. Philippians chapter 3. This is a really great passage. If uh, you understand the testimony of Paul, you know that Paul was a persecutor of the church. He was going after Christians. He was having them arrested, right? But then on the road to Damascus, he meets the Lord. The Lord speaks out of heaven, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord, that I might know who I am persecuting? Paul does a 180, becomes the greatest church planter the world has ever seen. But before that, he was quickly rising in status in the Jewish faith, climbing the Jewish ladder of success. He talks about it in Philippians chapter 3. But then, in coming to faith in Christ, this is what he concludes. And the same word that James uses in James 1-2 is the word that Paul uses in Philippians 3-7. Turn there. Philippians 3-7 it says this. But whatever gain I had, he's just listed off all his accomplishments in the Jewish faith. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. He kind of begins talking in accounting terms. You know, I, I was of the tribe of, of, of Benjamin, man. I, I was rising, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a zeal for the Jewish faith that no one else had. All these lapel pins that Paul was wearing. He was checking off the box. This is a gain. This is a profit. This is good. These are all good things. But when he came to Christ, he realized all those good Jewish things were keeping him from Christ. He had invested so much in the Jewish faith. I have all these accomplishments. How could I ever follow someone like Jesus? But when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he concluded this. Whatever gain I had, whatever was on the profit side of my ledger. I've now moved over to the loss side. They were keeping me from Christ. I counted as loss. Same word that James uses. I thought differently about it. I look at all those accomplishments differently now. All those things were keeping me from Jesus. They weren't a profit. They were a loss. Then in verse 8 of Philippians chapter 3, indeed, I count everything as loss 
because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Do you see life that way? Do you know in your life there's nothing that compares to the value of knowing Jesus Christ? Everything else you would gladly give up before you would ever give up your faith in Christ. That's how much Jesus means to you. Because you know this life is so short. It could be done today. Today. And we step into eternity. And that's why Paul had the power and wisdom to say, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. I'm thinking totally different about life, Paul says. What I thought was profit was actually loss. And that same word is the word that James uses in the text. I count it all joy. I think about life differently now. Like Romans 12 says, be transformed. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Exactly. So all of us from now on, right? Every trial, we're not going to complain about it. We're not going to get bitter about it. That's the negative option. That will just lead you down further disappointments in life. The positive option is the one that God gives us. I don't like this trial, but God, I know you're working through it. And knowing that you're with me every moment of this trial, walking with me through it, that will give me joy. See, our God is not a distant, deistic God. He didn't wind up the creation clock and go off to a distant galaxy somewhere. He knows you, knows everything about you. He knows the hairs on your head. He knows the days you will live before you live them. That's how involved he is in your life. And his desire is to grow us up. A new way of thinking, knowing that our God is sovereign. Here's another textual point that we got to understand. Consider it all joy, not some of it. This whole experience, even though it's difficult, in this process of difficult storms in my life, I will consider it all joy. Because God, why? Promises a good result. What's the verse that promises that? Anybody know? What's the verse that promises a good result? That God is going to work it out. Thank you. Romans 8.28. Now, a lot of people have problems sharing that verse. By the way, I don't go into a hospital when somebody's uh, struggling with an illness. And, and here they are on the bed with 17 IVs in them. I don't go in and say, hey, uh, Pastor Mel's here. Romans 8.28. God's going to work all things together for good. And those who love God are called according to his purpose. I don't start with that verse, but I want you to know it's the foundation of every counseling session I ever have, the belief that our God is sovereign. And to me, I get a little bit tired of people that say, that verse is so trite, Pastor. How can you even refer to it? I've read articles like that, as if we should take that verse out of the Bible. I want to tell you, that's the foundation of what we believe, really. That our God is sovereign. If he's not sovereign, he's not God. If he's not God, he, he's not worthy to take the sins of the entire world upon himself. And our faith is in vain. But we believe in a God who has the ability, even though we don't, to work all things together for good. You might not figure that out until you step into eternity, but you will know it one day. Wow, when I thought God wasn't doing his job, when I was bitter in my spirit, God was working all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That's why we can have all joy. That's why Paul can said, say, I count all things as garbage compared to the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ. That's why we have such a heart for evangelism, my friends. Can you think of how empty the lives are of your neighbors who don't know Christ? They'll never tell you that. Why? Because they're shoving all these things into this void in their life that they think will fill the void, but it won't. And they know it down deep. They're empty. They're empty. That's why we have such a passion to share Jesus with others. That's why I pray for opportunities to 
to, to see God open doors for you to share your faith with others. Consider it all joy. Here's a third thing that we need to understand from the text. Key word. He doesn't say count it all joy if you experience a trial. He doesn't say that. It's count it all joy when. It's a reminder that we are living in a fallen world. Our rebellion against God has consequences. Why is there so much hate and destruction and death in this world? Because we have turned our back on God as a world and desire to push him out. If you don't believe that, go to the public schools. And if you're a public school teacher, we pray for you, honestly. We pray for you at our staff meetings because we know you have one of the toughest jobs out there. But if you don't believe God is being pushed out of our culture, just go to the public schools. You know what I did for seven weeks a few months ago when we walked through the scientific evidence for God. I believe with all my heart that if an objective person was confronted with that scientific evidence, an objective person would say there is a God. But is any of that evidence shared with our students in high school? No. They refuse to. If you're a teacher that tries, even though it's confirmed scientific evidence, if you try to share it, you will be either fired or you'll be reapplied somewhere else. So we need to pray for our kids because they are being robbed, as I said last week, of their identity in Christ. We are pushing God out, and that rebellion has consequences. Here's point number four. It's this. Various trials. We need to understand that trials arise in a number of ways. Let me give you the categories. Category number one, beyond our control. A lot of things happen beyond our control. It's a trial. Like an illness or a sickness or a loss of a loved one or a loss of a job. Persecution that we may experience. Even God's plan can take us through a trial. I.e. example, Jesus. When he prayed, Lord, may this, Father, may this cup pass from me. But not my will. What did he say? Thy will be done, right? That there was something amazing that God was doing in his plan, but it would cost Jesus a great deal of pain. Here's another category of trials. It's God's discipline. In the book of Corinthians, it talks about people abusing the Lord's Supper. And the Bible says some are sick and some even sleep as a result of God's judgment on them. Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5, in the face of all these miracles happening in the early church, they lied to God. They lied to God, and both of them dropped dead in front of the apostles. See, God disciplines those he loves. And as children of God, he will discipline us to bring us back to the path. And sometimes that can be painful. C.S. Lewis put it this way, pain is the megaphone of God. So often when things are going our way and everything's great, man, we don't have time to listen to God because I've got all my successful uh, uh, accomplishments over here that I've got, I've got to attend to. I don't have time to listen to God. But I'm telling you, when you're laying on your back in a hospital, you have time. You have time. God sometimes slows us down to help us to listen to him more effectively. Here's another category of trials, the consequences of our sin. It wouldn't be right for someone to say who uh, went into a bank and tried to rob the bank, got arrested, thrown into jail for 30 years. God, why are you doing this to me? Yeah, you don't say that, right? No rational person would say that. It's a consequence of your sin. Sometimes we make bad decisions contrary to the word of God. And I often say this in counseling sessions, if you choose to sin, you choose to suffer. You're moving away from God's plan into more suffering. It's often a result of our rebellion and not following the amazing wisdom of God's word. But here's the conundrum for a lot of people. Can God take evil actions of others and use evil for his purposes? Absolutely he can. Yes, God uses evil for his purposes, but he never does evil. And be careful never to blame him for evil. I've had people say to me over the years, Mel, one of my struggles is I have to get to the point where I forgive God. What? No. No. God never does anything wrong. God never does evil. 
You don't have to forgive God because he doesn't need it. He's perfect, right? It's us that don't understand how God is working. It's us that, that often have the attitude that doesn't reflect the reality of God in us. And we have to change. See, it's this, I call it a theological black box. It's one, another one of these theological black boxes. I've talked about salvation being one. How God, being sovereign, can still say, I desire for all to come to salvation. Jesus saying, as he looked over Jerusalem, I would have gathered you like a hen gathers its chicks, but you would not. Those two, sovereignty of God and human responsibility, all, all who will may come. It's a conundrum for us. How does God do that? Seems like a contradiction. In our fi finite minds, it does. But in God's ultimate sovereignty, in, in God's economy where we serve a God that works in ways that are much higher than we can even imagine or think, it's not a contradiction. Same is true with this theological black box. God's providence using trials for good, Romans 8, 28, and trials caused by living in an evil, fallen world. God can use evil to accomplish his purposes. And we talked about one great example, the cross already. Joseph, another one in the Old Testament. Remember that? Brothers sold him into slavery. They were going to kill him. Sold him into slavery. He eventually saves all of Egypt and Israel. And Joseph reveals himself as second in command of Egypt to his brothers and said these powerful words, what you intended for evil, God intended for good, for the saving of many lives. God took your evil actions and brought back an amazing result. See, that's where trust comes in for all of us, Riverview. For me as a pastor, for me as a dad, as a husband, as a friend, for you as well, in everything you do, to trust God's ability to work it out, to trust God's ability to take what we struggle with in life and bring about an amazing result. And that's why we can have joy. I define joy as this, the state of inner well-being, peace, and satisfaction that comes from knowing that God is alive and sovereign in the universe he created. Do you believe he knows you? Do you think God knows you're sitting right here right now? Of course he does. Does he know everything about you? Yes, he does. And what he promises, he will bring to a final good result. That's the kind of God that we serve. He is sovereign in everything that he does. So here, I want to hit you with it. Can you handle the truth? Here it is. A truth is not trite if it's the truth. Believe with all your heart that God is working out something good in the difficult experiences that you have. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm not saying the pain is going to be any less. And I get it. Pain can be very debilitating. It can be very debilitating. But our struggle is to walk through that trial one step at a time. Trusting God. You know, they say Christians are like tea bags. You really don't know what flavor they are until you put it in hot water. Amen? It's true. When you get in the hot water of a trial, the flavor of your Christianity is going to come out. It's going to come out. And that's how we identify the areas of our life that need to change. Here's the second point. It's this. God's intentional purpose is to grow up us up, to grow us as Christians. Uh, verses 3 through 4. Let's read it real quickly again. It says this. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now, here, here's a question. Why does God test us? Is God trying to find out where Mel Svensson is at? You know, I can't really figure out where Mel's at. Where's his heart at? I'm going to test him because I don't know. Of course not. God knows exactly where my heart is at. He knows exactly where I'm at. I'm being tested to help me identify the areas in my life that need to change. That's how much God loves us. He wants me to know, hey, Mel, this is your weak point. This is your rough edge that needs to be shaved off. 
This is where you're not matching the image of Jesus Christ in your life. And God will test us to help us identify that point. It's not for his benefit, it's for ours. And what is he trying to bring about? Here it is, steadfastness. The, the testing of your faith produces test fastness. I, I believe a test can be defined like this. A process used for evaluation or diagnosis with a goal of improvement. My brother worked for the CIA for many years. He passed away a number of years ago, sadly, and I'll get to that in just a second. But he worked for the CIA. He was an engineer that graduated from NJIT, got hired by the CIA, but he always loved space. I think I've shared that with you before. He loved space. He knew everything about every astronaut, every Apollo, Gemini mission, every space shuttle. He knew it all. And in the CIA, they said to him, and his, his desire was, he actually promoted this with the CIA, I would like to build a bridge with NASA and see how the CIA and NASA can work together. And they said, go for it. And he did. And NASA loved my brother because he loved NASA. And they would call the CIA about stuff that was going on if my brother wasn't there. And I learned this at my brother's funeral. So I said to my supervisor, was, was my brother good at what he did because he could never talk about his job being in the CIA? And he said, like, they like, you don't know? Oh, your brother changed the way we did everything. He built this relationship with NASA, changed how we related to NASA. And, and they would call from NASA. If your brother wasn't here, they wouldn't talk to anybody else. They would just talk to your brother. Well, my brother was an expert, according to this supervisor that I saw. Of, he said, Mel, there are, I have guys that are launch system experts in China. They know China well, but they don't know Russia. And they don't know North Korea. And they don't know France. But your brother was a launch expert for all of these nations. He compiled it all and would synthesize it all. And he, he, was, he was an expert, irreplaceable. That's how, and I'm very proud of him. Amen, thank you. Very proud. I knew nothing of that before his funeral. I only found it out from his supervisor who looked at me like, you don't know your brother? And, and so anyway, what happened was, remember that space shuttle that took off and exploded over Texas? All right. If you remember that, when the space shuttle took off, there was a plank of ice that fell off the launch structure and onto the wing of the space shuttle. My brother wasn't at that launch. He generally was. And at the landings, he wasn't at that one, but saw it on TV. Saw the video of this plank hitting the wing of the space shuttle. Called seven NASA officials, said, you can't bring that shuttle back down. He said, I was at tests where we would shoot something as small as a pencil at a NASA space shuttle wing. That pencil would compromise the wing of the space shuttle. Because it was made, if you know about the space shuttle, with tiles that were very chalky in their feel. In fact, my brother showed me one, brought one to me one day and said, these are the tiles of the space shuttle. And the chalk would dissipate the heat very quickly because the space shuttle would come back into Earth's orbit and atmosphere and obviously become very hot. These chalk tiles would dissipate the heat amazingly, but they were very fragile. And my brother said, I was at test where we would shoot different objects at the wing to see how they would impact the integrity of the wing. And he said, Mel, we would shoot a pencil at the wing at a certain speed. It would compromise those tiles to the point where you couldn't bring the space shuttle back down. I watched a 2 by 10 plank hit the wing. Those seven calls were all rebuffed by NASA. They said, we've got it. We've, our guys have looked at it. They think we're fine. Well, we all know what happened. The space shuttle came down, exploded over Texas. They called my brother because they demanded that someone outside of NASA lead an investigation as to what went wrong, what could have been done to correct the situation. And my brother led that investigation. And in fact, at his funeral, he died after submitting the report. He died late one night in his office after getting the report in. We went to his funeral, came back to the hotel room, and there was a news story that said, NASA just released the report of what went wrong with the space shuttle explosion over Texas. But I say that to say this, and I was so proud of my brother. But he died, like I said, uh, of a heart attack in his office and never got to see actually the, re the, the results or response to that amazing investigation that he led. But they tested these wings to make sure they could handle the heat of reentry again and again. My brother said they, they tested them over and over. They knew exactly how much these wings could take and what they could not take. And as God tests your life, he's 
developing in you the ability to become a person who is steadfast, a person with steadfast faith. The Greek word here is hupomone. The picture is an Olympic a weightlifter picking up a mass amount of weight, jerking it up to his shoulders, lifting it above his head, locking his arms. Because the word hupomone means to stand under that weight victoriously. That's what God is seeking to produce in your life and mine. But you have to let it happen. In fact, the text said, says that. Let it happen. You need to allow God to do it. James 1.4, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. My friends, God is working in your life. He's working in the life of this church. Let it happen. Allow God to build in you this steadfast faith to get to the goal. We'll never perfectly get there, but to be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The process is so clear in James that God tests our faith to bring steadfastness into our lives so that we could be like Christ, perfect and mature. And in that process is where we find the joy. God, thank you for working in my life. You're teaching me new things every day because I know, God, you want me to be like Jesus. Let me close with this quote. I love this thought, you know, that who God is, this awesome God, that knows you and loves you enough to go to a cross and die for you. And, get, and where God wants to take you should give us joy no matter what God utilizes. And as we face trials in our lives, my friends, let it be a reminder, God's at work in my life. He's making me more like Jesus. He's strengthening me to face the challenges that lie ahead. And like Paul, you will say victoriously, I count knowing Jesus a surpassing value compared to the trials of this world. Amen, church? Amen. Let's pray together. And as your heads are bowed, maybe you're going through a trial right now and you're struggling, but know that God's at work in the trial. And with that realization, know that there can be joy in your life. Because God hasn't left you. He will never forsake you. God is intimately involved in our lives. And as you walk through the day, he's right there. His desire is to strengthen us. And when we are weak, when we realize our weakness, it's then that we are strong. Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you're not a distant God off in some galaxy somewhere. But you're right here. And I pray, God, that you'd work in my life and in the life of everyone here today. I know you will, because you love us. And you'll take the negative circumstances of this world and bring about an awesome result. And we pray this in the amazing name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. So let's stand together and sing this chorus. Oh, to be like you, give up. Just to know you, Jesus, there's no one beside you, forever the hope in my heart. Oh, to be like you, I give all I have just to know you, Jesus, there's no one beside you, forever. So I'm going to stay right here. I don't want to have the chance of giving any of this to any of you. So God bless you. Love you. Live this week. All for him.